Hello, and welcome to the From the Shadows podcast. I am the producer, Jason Lewis. I would like to thank you for tuning in to the From the Shadows podcast. And without further ado, here is your host, Shane Grove. Hey, welcome everybody to this episode of From the Shadows podcast. I am your host, Shane Grove. And with me is the super producer, Jason. How's it going tonight, everyone? And the elusive, yet fun to have along, Elisa. How are you doing, Elisa? I'm doing very well. How are you? I can't complain. If I did, you I know you wouldn't listen, so uh, you know, there's no <laughs> point. <in it. laughs> hey, and before we bring, um, you know, we're super excited about the guest we have on tonight. But before we bring him on, I want to mention um, for all of our listeners who don't uh, go and participate on our After the Shadows uh, discussion group on Facebook, we are running a contest on there. And this contest relates to the book series that I uh, that I have. I, I've written a couple books for those who haven't been paying attention or don't care. Um, I have written a couple books, and it's a series, and it's loosely based about uh, and includes some of the podcast characters, uh, and I do mean characters because everybody on the podcast is a character. And uh, I, I can't even make fun of Jerry because he's never here, but we will anyway. Um, so, so what we've done is a good friend of mine, Earl Music, who is a fellow federal employee, or I should say, recently retired federal re- employee with the post office. He is a uh, basically a nationally renowned uh, artist. He's a comic, you know, does some comics, does some illustration. He put together a really cool looking treasure look. It looks like a treasure map um, of the area in which the book series from the shadows. I know it's really creative, isn't it? But uh, it's from the shadows is the book series volume one and volume two are out with and volume three is due to come out in July. And so all the only thing I'm missing for the volume three is the name of the town in which that story takes place. So if you want to, you want to get in on, um, you know, add your little twist to, to pop culture. Am I making this sound like that's going to be really important? Get, get your creative juices flowing. <laughs> Add to the um, cacophony. Yo, oh, geez. So, so what? There's six spots on the map that are little towns that I that I have not uh, assigned a name to inside this story. So we kind of, I'm kind of encouraging people to go to. We have a specific post on the After the Shadows uh, discussion group. Head there find the post and give us some suggestions for some town names. Um, Anything cool. If you've read the books, you can kind of maybe have a better idea of, of what would fit Um, because on those maps, you'll see some of the locations from the first two books and you'll see some locations from yet to be published books. But uh, the whole idea was, is um, it give somebody a, the, the people who have enjoyed the books a, a chance to see the whole area in one spot. And quite frankly, I can't keep track of where everything's at either. So the map is just as much for me as it is for anybody else, but, but don't tell anybody that. Um, so, yeah. So if you get a chance and you want to, you know, want to go and, and, and join in the fun and, and enter the contest, um, go, Go find that post on After the Shadows um, or even on our Instagram. It'll help you. It'll take you to that post uh, on After the Shadows through our Instagram. And, you know, throw in a couple names. Make some, you know, something cool. Put it on there. If we pick your name as one of the towns, you will win something very special that Earl and I have cooked up. So... Um, uh, it's not that Earl and I are going to come to your house for a barbecue or anything, unless you really want us to come. 
I don't know. But uh, <laughs> that's that's not the plan. So so now that we got that out of the way, everybody, you know, go check out the books. They're available on Amazon. There seem to be, uh, you know, we have a merchant uh, uh, from the Shadows podcast merch page coming up. You can order the books as well as some other merch. Um, T-shirts, coming coffee out. mugs. T-shirts, coffee, stickers. Um, Alyssa, are you going to, you know, add anything special on the merch page? You know, you're going to sign some old tennis shoes or oh, anything yes. like that? Okay, I, didn't know. <laughs> I don't know. Not yet. Maybe later. Maybe later. Okay, and uh, and just come have some fun with us on the after the sh- after the uh, after the shadows page because it is a lot of fun. We try to do something every day that uh, will uh, start your day off with a little giggle about Bigfoot or UFOs or ghosts or you know anything. So, and folks, so feel. I was going to say, folks. Feel, share, uh, feel free to share any names you would like for these cities. Uh, I find it hilarious, and uh, <laughs> it's just great to have the participation. Yeah, there's been there's been some good ones for sure. Yes. So, uh, uh, so, so now that we've got that out of the way, let's get to the real fun of what we've got cooking tonight. Um, we have a very special guest. Uh, Mr. Cameron Jones. Cameron, you there? Yep, I'm here. Hello. Oh, uh, we didn't put you to sleep? We didn't, you're still no, awake? no, no. I was I was very interested. <laughs> <laughs> what a liar. I can't believe you lied. First thing. Uh, was, uh, uh, but, yeah. but for those who don't, who aren't familiar with Cameron, um, Cameron is, I, I, we're just going to say, it, our first verifiable expert on the Mothman. So Cameron, welcome to the show. We're very excited. Uh, Elise is very excited because yes. uh, for, for three weeks or four weeks, it's been like, I can't wait for Cameron to be on. I can't wait for Cameron. You know, I mean, it's, it's crazy. Uh, yeah. so, so, so Cameron, welcome. And, and let's get into it. Tell us a little bit about yourself and and, and, and how you okay. got interested in the Mothman? Yeah, I'm. Um, yeah, I was so excited when Alyssa messaged me and asked me to be a guest because I love talking about um, the Mothman. First of all, of course, my name is Cameron Jones, and I'm a um, paranormal researcher. One of the areas that I um, specialize in and have a lot of interest is, of course, the Mothman. One of my main areas. Um, of research, but I also um, basically I look into um, ghosts, all kinds of cryptids. Um, I'm a member of a UFO group here in my hometown of Circleville. So basically, I'm kind of into anything strange and mysterious, just like that, the kind of whole group of the supernatural. But as I said, Mothman is one of my my main interests and in areas of study. And um, yeah, when Alyssa asked me if I wanted to come on. Talk- on and talk on the mouth man i was very excited because we know with the coronavirus a lot of things have been canceled and i actually had quite a few upcoming events to um um library events and such to talk about the mouth man's and all those have been canceled or delayed so it, it was i was really excited to be able to come on and do this because it was you know i was i was pretty depressed that all of um the events have been canceled but um, yeah, i've been interested yeah it's it, it really sucks as I had um, so, I basically started my whole Mothman. Go ahead. So you so you have oh, a lot sorry. of you have a lot of pet, uh, Mothman frustration that you just want to get out tonight. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I basically I basically just started this like I was going to call it like a Mothman tour, where I, like I, I did one I did one at uh, the library in um, southeastern Ohio, uh, southwestern Ohio, and it went really well. And this one I had a couple other libraries contact me and i was like yeah i'll just do like this little moth band tour you know these libraries around ohio would be really fun well after the first date then it was like coronavirus and everything got canceled so yeah <laughs> it is kind of sad <laughs> well this wasn't going to be like a rolling stones thing where you called it the tour and then and then and then it the tour the last tour kept going on for a decade sort of deal <laughs> <laughs> like like you just I shouldn't say you're retiring because you're you're so you're very young, so you're just getting getting started. <laughs> so, yeah, but I've so, had an interest. Go ahead. 
But no, I mean, so that's what I was just going to ask. So, what, okay. And before, and before, I want everybody to understand, okay, just that you're like in my book, and we discussed this, Cameron. We ha- hash this out. You're the number two guy in the world when it comes oh to Mothman. Gosh. No, you're the number two <laughs> guy, okay? Because you, t- I mean, this is the story, folks. The guy who runs the Mothman Museum. I don't know wh- wh- what's his name. You said it to me, Cameron. Oh, Jeff Jeff Lamsley. And you said he is probably the number one guy in the world knows more than there. I mean, I mean, I guess if you're going to run the museum, you should probably be an expert, like the, the, the go-to guy, right? Yeah. He's, he's, he's by far the number one Mothman, um, you know, researcher, historian in the world. You know, he's on, I, I, when I was, I was in high school, I would see him on TV, you know, talking about the Mothman and I was always, you know, so excited to hear about it. But yeah, he, he also runs the museum, the official Mothman Museum right there in Point Pleasant. He lives in Point Pleasant. Yeah, so ladies, and, ladies, and, ladies and gel, gentlemen and children listening at home, when he's too busy to go to an event, Cameron's the guy he calls. That makes Cameron <laughs> number two. Hey, I, that's in my book. Number two is not too bad. So, so why, what, what made you? Other than kind of the area, and I mean, you live in Southern Ohio, so I mean, it's kind of you get you're kind of close to where this all generated from. What what really sparked your interest in the Mothman? Why why the Mothman? Why not Bigfoot? Why not uh, you know Dogman? Why not uh, you know something else? Why the Mothman? Well. Um... Yeah, I remember. I'm I'm only, I'm only about an hour from Point Pleasant, and I remember when we would go on family trips. When I was a kid, we would always, you know, we would always go, you know, this specific drive to like Florida or whatever, and I'd always see like the 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 turnoff, you know, Point Pleasant, and and I and it was always so intriguing. And the, even as a kid, um, I don't exactly know where my my first um, my first um, where the where I first heard about the Mothman, but I mean as far back as I can remember, I remember you know the Mothman it was a scary monster in Point Pleasant. But as I got older and got into you know this research of the uh, par- paranormal, and there was just there was just something about the Mothman that just seemed like you know I just always like I I, I think that's I think that's real. I, I there was something about watching these witnesses on TV and reading about it. I was like you know there's just something about this that, that just, that, that speaks true to me. And, um, I was like, I want to learn more about it. I, I, I want to go down there and I, I want to, you know, I want to go out to where the Mothman roamed and in the TNT area. And, and it really just, it, it all started when I was a kid and, and when I was a teenager, just learning more about it. And as an adult, it just became kind of an obsession, I guess. Hmm. So I, 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 this, I mean, I obsessed over chocolate and ice cream as a kid growing up. <laughs> it may be, it may be baseball. <laughs> what? I mean, I, every story and we'll get into this. We'll let, we'll let you tell of all of our listeners the, you know, the legend of mm-hmm. Mothman and, and stuff. But I mean, and we kind of talked about this before. I mean, that, this is one of the scariest in my book. This and the Dog Man, um, to me, are two of the scariest kind of cryptid, uh, cre- you know, things that are out there right now. Because I cannot put them in a box of what exactly they are, because they don't seem like it's a big moth, okay? <laughs> and it doesn't make sense to me that there's a moth that's a man or vice versa Mm -hmm. same with the dog man it just seems to me like these are entities that have a foot in in two different realms you know the what's going on here and then a supernatural realm and i have to imagine your pro i mean that has to run through your mind doesn't it i mean how so so what makes you think man i want to go out there to the tnt area where because you got to go at night i mean you can't go a day in the daylight, right? You got to go out there at night and experience it the same way the witnesses did, right? Yeah, yeah, it's definitely like a different place at night. You know, you can go on the the, the, the tours 
out to the TNT area and others during the day and, you know, see everything. But it, it really is, you know, totally different at night. And it is, it is really spooky just to know that, you know, it was at nighttime when, when these witnesses saw the Mothman. It was, it was always um, nighttime when, when they encountered him. So, yeah, it definitely, you know, in the back of your mind for sure. Because, you know, according to some people, Mothman's still out there. You know, oh, some boy. people say that he's, he, he, still, he still roams that area. So you never know. But yeah, it is creepy for sure. I, oh boy. So, and, and I gotta be honest and I know Alyssa and I have talked about, I mean, I stopped at Point Pleasant last summer and it, I mean, the vibe of that place is really weird. I mean, I think it, it, it comes off to me at least as almost like it, it is. There's, there's definitely like when you go down to, um, to like to downtown Point Pleasant, it's almost like the town is kind of stuck in time too. It's, it's like, it, and it's, <laughs> It, it has a really like kind of creepy, almost otherworldly vibe to it. It, yeah. I mean, I guess that's a good way of of putting it because it just doesn't it doesn't feel right. Like it, like I stood, you know, I kind of stood there and went to the Mothman Museum and I couldn't get in because the number one guy in the world that made him close at five. And uh, no, I, yeah, you told and me I was there. I was there at five o two. I mean, I just wanted a T-shirt, but uh, in, but we kind of drove. I think we drove maybe to McDonald's, which you know, hey, maybe that adds to the whole feeling of not being right is going to McDonald's. Um, <laughs> but it's just, but you just kind of sit there in the way the town's laid out, and you just mm-hmm. kind of. I just kind of like looked around, and I did not have a real good frame of reference of like I can imagine where the bridge was, and yeah you know, and that disaster in and of itself is without the Mothman probably would leave a pretty heavy feeling um, on an area just from the tragedy that that, uh, you know, caused and the, you know, just the the death and the, and the sorrow and uh, negative energy that comes from that. But I'll tell you what, it's the kind of place where I felt like I hope, I hope nothing happens. And I get stuck here because it just it just didn't feel right. So I strongly urge everybody to go visit Point Pleasant and see <laughs> <laughs> and experience it for themselves. Well, I would but, like uh, to do that myself. I was really envious when you went, Shane. <laughs> yeah, but you're kind of strange. You know, you and Jerry always want to do that crazy stuff. Oh yeah, you just absolutely. Uh, it's, be- it's because you don't know any better. Well, here's here's the thing. I just recently found out that sightings of this this creature have gone all the way back to like the mid '60s. I mean, I you know didn't know about the uh, Mothman that far that far back, and and they find out that you know there's been reports of back in like mid '60s. It's, I was like, wow, there's there's got to be something to it, Cameron. I think so. Yeah, yeah. Um... Basically, the the stories all started in 1966, um, and they lasted up until the the bridge collapse in in 67. It was almost two years. It was about a year and a half in the mid 60s, and um, yeah, it all started. Uh, uh, Linda and Roger Scarberry with uh, their two friends, Steve and Mary Millette, where they were driving out. They were just teenagers in the car driving outside of town, cruising around the TNT factory area, and they saw two red eyes in the shadows. And um, they quickly saw that you know those eyes were attached to this weird animal creature, six and a half, seven foot tall, shaped like a man, but with two large wings folded against its back. And basically, that scared them. They they took off towards Route 62, heading towards town, and and this thing and this thing followed them. And they thought they had lost it at one point. And they look over and they see they see this creature again on a nearby ridge, and it you know spread its wings and took off. And at that point, it chased them all the way into town. And it was basically that sighting of the uh, Lyndon Rogers Scarberry sighting that kicked off the whole. Um, whole shebang, so to speak, when you know you had witness after witness, encounter after encounter. Wow. So, so um, these guys, those first witnesses. I mean, did they hear anything? Did they? 
they didn't come in any kind of, it's not like it did it attack the car or it just kind of like chasing them out of the area. Yeah. It was like, yeah, they, they, they saw it. They, uh, you know, kind of followed them. They thought they took it and then, you know, it showed back up. And at that point it was flying right over the car, you know, as they were going, you know, upwards of 55 miles an hour, you know, this, this thing never, never lost, you know, that never, um, uh, it, it just it kept up no matter how fast they would go it kept up and then it, it broke off its pursuit at the city limit um so no it, it didn't necessarily, it didn't attack the car i don't i don't i don't remember ever uh reading or hearing of them um hearing any kind of noise but you know just seeing that and experiencing that was probably you know scary enough they actually actually it scared them so much that they the first stop they went into when they got in town is they went to the police station and they reported it surprisingly enough the police actually took them seriously and took down their reports and the police went out there looked around what the you know they weren't quite sure what what the heck was going on but they didn't see anything but um you know i think it kind of says a lot that you know they were they were so scared so believable that the police you know they they took this seriously oh absolutely so, that would be terrifying so what did the police i mean what did they think i mean what did they think was actually I mean, did they really think that there was a six and a half foot winged creature with red eyes chasing them, or did they just, you know, want to get to the bottom of it and think it was something else? Yeah, at, at that point with the with the original sightings, I really don't think they 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 didn't know what to think. But I mean, it was you know once you know the the the, the sightings continued and the reports were so similar and you know. They were, they all had, you know, these similar elements. They all, had, you know, they, it was always this tall winged creature with two, and the eyes. The eyes were always, you know, the most, you know, frightening aspect. And the witnesses always described the huge red eyes. So I think at that point, you know, the the, the police said there's probably something to this, and I, and I think they definitely at at some point they were like, yeah, there's there's something out there. Now I, I don't know what, you know. They never like made a statement on it or anything, but you know they always they took these reports and for the most part they took it seriously. So how so how long then was it before the next sighting? Um, basically, um, after that first night, I think it was two two days later there was a second sighting, and then almost every night for you know a solid two months there was a sighting. Um, you were asking earlier if. You know, Mothman never attacked a car or anything. Well, there is one instance. It was, uh, I think it was about two weeks after the original sighting, there was a witness called Faye DeWitt. She was actually, she was 14 years old at the time, I believe. Uh, she had heard of the Mothman and her brother. Her and her brother went out in their car to see if they could find the Mothman. You know, I don't think they really thought they were going to see anything, but, you know, the talk of the Mothman was all over town. And they went out to the TNT area and they actually at one point looked over and realized that this, this thing with this red eyes and these huge wings was flying alongside the car. And there was one point in the chase where um, he lost the brother who was driving, lost control of the car. The car spun out by the old, um, um, by the old uh, power plant and the Mothman actually jumped onto the hood of the car and, and stared into the car at them. So, so that that was one case where the Mothman actually, you know, I guess you could almost call it an attack, where he, you know, jumped on the car, and that that just scared the crap out of them, you know. <laughs> Holy smokes! Yeah, and and I can imagine, yeah, I can imagine, like you said, it, it wouldn't take long in a town that size for word to get out, you know, and like, hey, these guy, it, these kids saw something, you know, and kind of. Uh, the hysteria taken over, so to speak. Yeah, there was but, kind of a hysteria for sure. So, so we're so these two questions come to mind, and and I've you know, and of course, it, everything I've ever heard about it, it, a lot of it centers around the old TNT factory, right? And that's that's like a, was it a munitions factory for the what World War Two or Vietnam War or what was that? Yeah, um, back during World War II, the um, TNT area, that actually got the name TNT area because that's they actually manufactured and stored um, ammunitions for the war there. 
um, outside of town, what became known as the TNT area. And um, there's these, you know, the famous igloos, they call them, which are actually um, kind of huge kind of caverns that they store the munitions in. And um, yeah, basically, after, right after the war, the, um, the area was kind of abandoned by the government. But um, yeah, the name TNT area comes from they actually did store munitions there during the war. So that so that place had been abandoned for close to twenty years then, and nobody, you know, it was what just a place for kids to go hang out or or dare each other to go check out or something. Or uh, yeah, exactly. Yeah, um, but at that point, the government pulled out um, the forty six, so it had been abandoned, and that's exactly what it was. You know, the kids in town would go out there, they would race their cars, they'd run around, you know. And it was just a place for the, the teens to hang out and, and stuff like that. So, so were most of the witnesses um, teenagers? I mean, were the most because they were the ones going out there. And, and if that's the place, I guess, for lack of a better term, the habitat of the Mothman, is that is that what was going on? That these kids were the ones going out there and hanging out and then they being terrorized by this creature or... Were there adults or anything like that that, that had experiences that came forward? Yeah, uh, uh, initially, it, there was a lot of teenagers who were seeing the Mothman, and it, you're exactly right, it's because they were the ones out there. But w- once once these stories started to get out, you had more and more people, not just teenagers, going out um, you know, to see what was going on. And it wasn't specifically just in the TNT area. I can think of one case um, – I think his name was Connie Joe Carpenter. She was an adult. She was actually the niece of reporter Mary Heyer. Um, and she uh, was visiting um, a, a friend who, um, who who lived near that area. And um, and I'm sorry. Yeah, it was sorry. There's so many names here. It was, it was Marcella Bennett. And um, and she was she uh, was her brother actually lived near the TNT area. And she was visiting his home, and she had an encounter with the Mothman there. So it was kind of like the whole area outside of town. So, so did any? So there was was there ever any Mothman sightings in areas that? I'm assuming there was nothing in town. Everything was out in the country. Yeah, I don't really know of any reports of the Mothman being seen inside the town. No. Okay, and and so were, and most of them were centered around the TNT area. Yes, correct. So In the what's, surrounding area. So what did they? Okay, so back then, what exactly did the police and, you know, what did anybody else do? Did they go and do an extensive search of the TNT? Did they, um, after, I mean, I would think after two weeks of somebody seeing something out of the T I, I would start staking out the TNT place as a, as the police, you know, as the sheriff's department or whatever, and trying to figure out who's out there messing around. Oh, definitely. Any yeah, a lot of the, a lot of the townspeople actually, you know, took it in their own hands and they went out there with guns and they were determined that they were going to kill this creature. And, uh, I remember there's there this one, there's this one case where, um, you know, these hunters said, if we find it, can we kill it? And if there's more than one, can we kill it? You know, can we kill them? You know, so there you had you. It was a really a, it was it was you're asking for disaster because you had kids running around trying to find the Mothman and wanting to have their experience. And you had hunters with guns walking around, you know, probably some of them were probably drinking. You know, they, they were de- determined they were going to hunt the Mothman and find him and kill him. So, you know, um, yeah, some people decided they were going to take it in their own hands. And so. Oh, so did anybody ever, I mean, did everybody ever get to defend themselves against this, against this creature, like get a shot off or, uh, make any kind of physical contact? Um, no, not that I'm aware of. I don't know of anybody who actually saw the Mothman and tried to shoot it. I mean, it, you know, they were out there looking for it, but I don't really, I don't, I'm not aware of any cases where. Um, the Mothman was, you know, specifically shot at, and they thought they hit it or anything like that. Jeez. So, so what is in, in all your research? What is the one or two incidences that really like shook you when you read it? Like 
if this would have been if I'd have been out there and this would have happened, I'd, other than the jumping on the roof or the hood of the car, because that would have certainly um, <laughs> that would have certainly uh, made you have to get some clean drawers after that, because that would be. <laughs> so I mean, what what were some cases that cases that really stand out to you? Um, there was, um, I think going back to, um, again, yeah, I think the fade to wait encounter was one of the most amazing and, and she was the one who was out there with her brother and it jumped on the car and, um, they got out and it actually jumped from the ground to the top of the power plant and it, the brother started throwing pieces of coal at it and it actually jumped from the top of the, the power plant and, and flew right towards them and the last second kind of veered off. So I, that's always been one of my favorite cases just because, you know, a, lo- a lot of these cases were just, you know, this person, this person saw the Mothman, you know, and then they drove away. But but her case was actually really detailed, and they had, like, an up-close, like, real encounter with it. So th- that's always been one that, that I thought was just amazing. And, um, um, the, the, again, the Marcella Bennett encounter was actually really incredible. She was the one who was visiting her brother and she actually had her baby with her and she was, you know, basically attacked by the moth man. You could say, you know, it basically had knocked her down. Of course, fortunately the baby wasn't hurt, but she ran towards her car. And as she was opening the door, she looked over and literally right in front of her was the, you know, this winged creature. And she got such a good look at it that she, she, she described looking up and seeing what looked like a man's legs but they were covered in feathers. And as she looked up, she saw the torso and then the huge wings open up. And then of course the red eyes. And she actually described being almost hypnotized by the eyes. And you hear that, you hear that in other cases too. Um, and I mentioned Linda Scarberry earlier. She was one of the original Mothman witnesses. She actually claims to have had encounters, dozens of encounters for the rest of her life. She felt she was really haunted by the Mothman. So her story is one that always stands out to me because she she claims to have multiple multiple encounters um, for many years, and she always came off as believable to me. So um, she, yeah, like I said, um, those are some that have always really stuck with me. That just just either are really interesting or are, are extra kind of creepy or you know fascinating in certain ways. I mean, to me, that's amazing here. <laughs> Hearing that they saw the thing, because how so? How high? How high is that thing jumping from the ground to the top of the power plant? You know that. Yeah, that that's amazing, and yeah, uh, I I can only I can't even guess how. I mean, I've seen pictures of the old power plant before it was turned down. I mean, it was it was I believe three to four stories tall, and this and this thing which went from standing on the ground and jumped to the top of the roof. So, so they're not, yeah. Oh my like goodness. This. So they're not like saying it flew up there. They're just saying like it jumped, like it jumped. Yeah, like well, like it, it jumped from the ground to to the top of the tower. Yeah. So the lady with the baby that had the really close look, who described mm-hmm. it as having feathers, was she the only one that's ever described it like that as having feathers, or was she? I mean, she got the best. Obviously, it sounds like the best look. Yeah, yeah. Like uh, the Mothman was always normally seen at night, and of course it's dark, and he's got the red eyes. And people always talk about being drawn to the eyes, but she, you know, happened to be looking down, and then slowly looked up, and she got this view. She got this really up close view of its whole body. And her, yeah, her case is definitely probably one of the best visual descriptions of the Mothman. Um, there, there are there are definitely other sightings where people have described feathers. It's interesting when people think Mothman, they think of a moth-like being, but that's he was, was actually described. Go ahead. I was gonna, I, that's what I was going to say is if the first person had seen feathers, we might be talking about like turkey dude or you know, chick, <laughs> turkey dude chicken, or chicken guy or something instead of Mothman. Like, like how did the how did that term come come? You know, the Mothman. Because it doesn't sound Actually, like... Actually, people, like people describe the... Um, uh, originally, um, people described the Mothman as 
as more bat like than anything else. But of course, the name okay. Batman was already taken, so uh, <laughs> they went with Mothman. Jeez. <laughs> Were they angling? Okay, let's just get to the point. Was Point Pleasant angling for their very own superhero? Is that what they were? Yeah. Just, that's what they're getting. <laughs> so, but the, the, the descriptions are, there are so many different, that's one of the interesting things about the Mothman is the descriptions, there's just a huge variety of descriptions. And, you know, um, different witnesses saw different things. And so, you know, that's a, that's a fascinating aspect of it. So, so it never, it never actually made contact physically with anybody. It just seemed like it was, really trying to scare people to stay out of the TNT area. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I, I think you could definitely say that. Like, that was, like you said earlier, that was like its home, so to speak. That's, you know, uh, it was where it was always, almost always seen or, or you know, just outside the TNT area. Um, so, yeah, yeah, I, I think you could say that. So, okay, so what... So what then are some of the best, you know, I'm sure there's been many attempts at trying to, um, you know, describe what this thing really is. Okay. So at that, at that time with what they knew, what were they going on? Like, what was their theories about what was out there chasing these kids around? I mean, did they have anything that they were working, working from? Well, um, yeah, that, that's that's one question that I get a lot, and that I think a lot of people, you know, ask is like, what what was the Mothman? What is the Mothman? And I think at the time there were, you know, some people who I know there was definitely some newspaper reports that you know said that were kind of debunking the sighting, saying it was either a sandhill crane was one of the really famous explanations. And, which I don't, uh, which I don't, I don't buy. Cause I'm yeah, sure. I don't buy that either. I don't buy the crane. You know, it's no, me either. And you know what? I don't know if you saw, but I was just at the zoo day before yesterday. Yeah, and I, did see I was it. going through the Columbus Zoo, the the, the, the uh, North America section, and I saw the sign for a sandhill crane. And I was like, I was like, oh, I forgot they have this. And so I went and looked. I'm like, and, you know, I'm, I'm looking at this you know, crane. I'm like, there's no way that, that that is what these people saw. You know. Um, one of the other explanations was they were seeing an owl in a, in, in a tree. They were seeing the owl's eyes, and they were assuming it belonged to, you know, this this huge creature. But I've never really bought this explanation. But but there was definitely an effort by, by some in, in the newspapers to try to explain it away as, you know, as, uh, some sort of misidentification. Now, now I have seen uh, pictures of a, and I can't, the species of owl that is pretty good sized. Okay. But I've never, you know, the few to, and you don't really ever see owls up close and personal. Okay. I mean, we live out in the country. Um, in fact, we just saw one up in a tree probably three weeks ago. Okay. And we really had Mm -hmm. to look, we heard it, but we really had to search for that. Uh, owl up in you know on on one of the lower branches and i mean yeah if you if there was a five six foot owl it would scare the crap out of you but i don't but i don't really i mean i've never had an owl heard of an owl attacking anybody or even coming really close to anybody let alone for a, a month straight you know what I'm saying? I mean, unless it's a rabbit owl, you know, what's, what, why, I, I've just never heard of any uh, instances of one or two attacks by an owl, let alone 40, you know? To, yeah, exactly. You know, so, so maybe one or two of those I could buy is a misidentification, you know, that's um, hyped up by the hysteria of what's mm-hmm. going on, but I can't. I, there's no way uh, unless you had everybody in on it and they thought, OK, we're just going to perpetuate this story and it just, you know, for whatever attention. Um, 
But it, it can't be true, though. I mean, um, an owl doesn't even fit the description. We're talking about the Mothman being described as a six or a seven foot tall dark humanoid figure with wings and bright glowing eyes. I mean, this thing is big. It's humanoid shaped. Well, what I'm saying is is the, the one species of owl that I have seen pictures of, it's probably three or four foot tall. So I, what I'm saying is is if you, and I don't even know if it's indigenous to that area, but I could see where maybe once or twice in a, in a moment of hysteria based on what's been going on, if you saw that maybe once or twice, you could, you'd say, oh my God, I saw, I saw the... I saw the Mothman, you know, this big winged creature. But I'm just saying is I don't think it could happen for 30 or 40 straight days, like the, the let alone, what, two a year and a half or two years. You know, yeah. it, just, it just doesn't. So, and I guess, I mean, uh, if that's our what we're going to say conclusively, that's what we believe. And I think that's probably, you believe it's not, a sandhill crane or a, or an owl. Like what, what is it? And what, what is its yeah. tie in to the TNT area? Yeah. Um, basically, uh, yeah. So the question, you know, that we're kind of getting into, what is the Mothman? You know, um, basically there's as many answers to that question as there is, you know, there was witnesses, you know, some, some people and mostly skeptics who, who never actually saw it themselves, you know, would say it was some sort of no, a known animal on misidentification. And then there, um, it's possible that maybe Mothman was a true cryptid. That is, an, you know, a, a, a unidentified creature not recognized by science. Mm -hmm. um, some people believe that Mothman is maybe an interdimensional being. Um, you know, so something that comes in and out of our world, you know, it's from somewhere else. And, you know, there's always a portal theory that, you know, some places there are portals for these things to come, you know, to come in and out. Maybe possibly there was there was something like that out of the TNT area. Um, and then there's the theory that Mothman was a mutated animal of some sort. And in the 1980s, the TNT area was was declared basically a, um, a hazardous, you know, hazardous waste area. And the government went in and made attempts to try to clean it up because basically the byproducts of all that of all the weapons manufacturing and storage had poisoned the ground. And there are reports of you know um, th you know three eyed frogs and mutated fish, you know that were seen out there in those little ponds. So one theory is that maybe it was some sort of you know freak mutated animal that you know what you know, occurred because of the, you know, the, all the chemicals that, that were released. Yeah. And, and, there well, are and some people and, and for, you know, for 40 years, I mean, let's wait 40 years before we go clean it up. <laughs> <laughs> you, know what I'm <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I mean, it's like, that's that, that, first of all, it's very irresponsible, but, uh, but yeah, I mean, to get to your, um, it just it just seems to me that there is a definite con you know it's obvious there's a connection between that and when you, we go to the the portal theory okay mm -hmm. I think that anything like that that's going to happen inter interdimensionally or uh, it's got to require a, a certain amount of energy and wouldn't it make sense that the energy that is probably out there from from all the stuff that they did, you know, the, the, uh, the TNT and the, um, cause they probably tested stuff and they made, you know, I, I don't know what it goes into manufacturing that, but there's gotta be an enormous amount of energy created and energy is, is probably still out there. You know, I mean the residue of it or the, um, just the, just the yeah. ability, you know, and, what I guess what I'm saying is it's available there to create a space for a portal type a portal type uh, thing to occur. To me, that's I mean, actually really interesting. That's like a really interesting theory. I don't think I ever really you know considered before, but uh, you know I, I think that's actually really a fascinating idea. Because I don't, I think 
But I think the judge has mentioned this before. Once, like you create the energy, once you create energy, um, and I don't even think that you. I mean, I, I, it doesn't go. I mean, it's still there, right? I mean, you could just change, put it in different forms, or you know. And he would speak so more, so much more eloquently than me on the on that subject. <laughs> but uh, it's just to me like it, there's just so much, so much there that maybe something could have drawn off of that to and used it as a way to come into our world to to, so, to, to manifest itself yeah mm-hmm. yeah yeah i was thinking um, maybe it even, could be where the place is positioned maybe it crosses the natural uh ley lines of the earth so maybe that's why there's such a a, a strange eerie feeling in that town because that is some type of uh, energy. And if it is an interdimensional creature, maybe what we're doing is when you go in there, you have that feeling. We're feeling the residue of that particular um, natural natural energy produced by the earth or the magnetic uh, fields that uh, cross the earth. Yeah, yeah that, that, that's actually a really good point for sure, yeah. Uh, it, you yeah. Know, when, when, go ahead. Well, and and also to that point is is just the just the crap that was left over. It's it is it's doing something in the ground. Okay, it's not just laying there in the ground. It is uh, breaking down. Um, you know, whatever the residue, whatever the byproduct was, it's breaking down, and in itself is creating energy by just the, just the process of of uh you know disintegrating or it's like a form of radioactivity yeah so it seems to me that uh it's it was kind of a perfect story because think about it if this did not start to almost 20 years afterwards uh after that Mm -hmm. place closed maybe it took those 20 years for that stuff in the ground and the energy to start building up from you know gases you know, uh, leaving the the, pro- the product in the ground or whatever. Um, you know, maybe that maybe that helped kickstart it or whatever. I don't know. Yeah. Um, no. And you know, something else that uh, to think about is um, as as um, he he mentioned earlier was maybe this whole area of Point Pleasant is just is prone to this kind of high strangeness because you know it's not just the Mothman. When when Mothman was first for very first reported in the papers, he was actually called the UFO bird, and you, you ah. see newspaper accounts online where he's called the UFO bird because mm-hmm. it, um, the whole Point Pleasant, Ohio, you know, Ohio Valley, had, had up up until the Mothman and, and after the, the sightings, it was in the middle of a huge UFO wave, and 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 UFOs were constantly being seen. And, you know, then they threw this Mothman in and, you know, people couldn't help but wonder if they weren't connected, you know, so. Right. And then, you know, yeah, so. Well, I was going to ask that if, yeah, that's that was something that came to me was what other phenomena was going on at the same time? Because, you know, we hear that with, yeah, we hear that with, uh, like, now the whole big, you know, Bigfoot sightings, a lot of people are seeing like the balls of light in the woods and tying those phenomena together. Now, you know, whatever that means, I don't think anybody's uh, figured it, you know, obviously hasn't figured it out. But that's what I was going to say is what other phenomena was going on at the same time? Yeah, there was a lot of, um, yeah, there was a lot of, you know, what they call high strength. That, that was, you know, so you had. You know, you had the um, the the UFO wave, and you had the Mothman, and um, I, I don't know if you guys are if you guys are familiar with the Woodruff, Derenberger, Ingrid Cold case. No, no. So that um, that kind of um, possibly ties in the whole Mothman. It was, I mean, it, we're, again, we're talking November '66, so it's right at that time. Um, Woodruff, Derenberger, he was a salesman, and um, he was driving. Returning, I'm actually from. He was returning from Marietta, Ohio, and I think he was going to his home, which was outside Parkersburg, West Virginia, and, and not not really that far from Point Pleasant. But you know, he had a really fascinating encounter um, 
on Route 77. He actually uh, witnessed a UFO um, flying over his, his work truck and actually flew in front of him, stopped on the highway, and kind of forced his, his car, his truck, to a stop. And he had an encounter with a being that came out of the UFO who um, was tall, tan skin, slick back hair. Um, he went by the name Injured Cold. And one of the most interesting things about Injured Cold was that he had this frozen smile on his face. And he spoke telepathically to, to Woodward Derenberger. And he, there was like a 10-minute back-and-forth conversation that kind of went back with him. And he said a lot of this being said a lot of really kind of strange, kind of off-the-wall stuff. And um, like I said, his mouth never moved, and he spoke telepathically, and um, he took off, uh, you know, flew away in, the, in this strange metallic kind of cigar-shaped UFO. And John Keel, which is, you know, the famous writer, he wrote The Mothman Prophecies, he, um, he, was, he interviewed Derenberger and uh, on his encounters with this alien, we'll call, we'll call him an alien, injured cold, and John Keel was actually convinced that the injured cold incident was tied into the Mothman's appearance, although he wasn't really sure how. But, you know, like I said, he was sure that there was a connection there between, you know, the Mothman, injured cold, and, the, the, you know, the UFO wave. So you had all kinds of crazy stuff going on, not even to mention the men in black. <laughs> oh, geez. <laughs> now, before we get to the men in black... What, so what were some of the things that this being said to Derek? Uh, mm -hmm. to the, uh, yeah, so, to yeah. The Andrew Cold said to Woodrow Derenberger. Derenberger. Um, yeah, I got a lot of weird stuff. He, I mean, he said, in one of his statements, he said, we eat, we breathe, we sleep, we bleed, even as you do. Kind of weird stuff like that. Hmm. Uh, something else he said was, I come from a nation much less powerful than yours. And, Which, uh, <laughs> yeah, that's that's kind of funny. Like, I just landed this a spaceship in front of you, but my nation's much less powerful than yours. Okay, <laughs> yeah, it was kind of really off the wall stuff. And um, so, are you yeah, saying this was... person? Are you saying this cre this being was from Canada? Is that what you're saying? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, he actually. Um, you know, like a, John Keel, he he considered the Woodrow Derenberger story. He considered he considered him to be a very um, believable witness. And um, injured cold when when he left that initial encounter, you know, he made it clear that he would be back, and that you know he would he would make communication again with with Derenberger, and he did multiple times. And um, yeah, so um, nobody really really quite knows what to make of that story. It's a very, very fascinating aspect of this whole, you know, Point Pleasant Mothman thing. Mm -hmm. And, um, yeah. So the, so the being never mentioned anything about what was going on in Point Pleasant then? Like, uh, or, or, I mean, could, were they even able to tie anything together to that? Um, no, he, he never mentioned the Mothman or anything specifically, I don't believe. But, you know, he, he was, you know, considered to be, um, you know, this kind of possibly alien, you know, creature. And, you know, he arrived and left in a UFO. And you did have that whole, you know, UFO flap going on in that entire area at that time. And I think Mothman was definitely connected somehow to, to the UFO sightings. So maybe there, were, maybe there is a connection there. John Keel definitely thought so, but. Yeah. The, wow. So I wonder if uh, Indrid Cold was uh, maybe his maybe go back to the superhero thing. Maybe his superhero. Maybe he was the Mothman. Maybe that's what he did at night. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I mean, hey. <laughs> that, that's a, that's some theory to entertain right there. <laughs> I mean, I mean, come on. I mean, that's what he and he just couldn't figure out like why nobody would talk to him. Like you, didn't, you know, it's a, like why is everybody running away? Um, so was so what's the story about the Men in Black from that time period? Yeah, so um, basically, um, 
as I said, so, you know, we're back in the mid sixties and the mob main sightings are going on. And at that time there was a local reporter um, by the name of Mary Heyer. And she had a column, you know, in the, in the small newspaper of the Point Pleasant um, area, she called it where the waters mingle. Cause I, I don't know if you know, but right there at Point Pleasant, you've got three waterway waterways that all combine. So, so she had this um, column where, where the waters mingle. And, you know, she basically write about anything she wanted. Well, she started reporting on the Mothman, you know, and she, she's actually credited, Mary Hyde was credited for, you know, being the first one to actually discuss the Mothman, you know, in, in, in a, you know, um, serious way. And um, she was putting articles out there. And suddenly um, you started getting these really strange gentlemen showing up in Point Pleasant. And in Point Pleasant in the 1960s, you know, everybody knew everybody. And suddenly you had people started seeing these strange, tall, weird looking men in black suits, you know, black tie, black hats. You know, um, they would be walking around town and they just they, they stood out, you know, like a red thumb and, you know, in this town. And, and they were specifically seen many times in their, you know, black car outside of Mary Heyer's office. And uh, Mary Heyer actually started getting visits from these, you know, as we'll call them men in black. And they would come into her office and they would make, you know, kind of vague threats saying, you know, well, what, what right do you have to be, to, to be talking about this? You know, you need to stop the, you need to stop, you need to stop reporting on this Mothman business. And there's, you know, there's not only did they look strange, but they acted strange. And, you know, Mary Heyer definitely mentioned that. She says that there's just something very strange about these men. You know, they would, you know, they would, they would do weird things, you know, like I remember there was this one case where she said he picked up a pen and he was looking, looking at the pen, like he didn't know what it was. And there's a lot of strange things about, about, about these guys. And, um, so basically, they start showing up and threatening, kind of, you know, making big threats to people, and and visiting people who were, you know, talking about the Mothman or visiting witnesses who had seen the Mothman. They would show up and kind of, you know, tell tell them that, you know, you need to shut up about this. You don't need to be telling anybody about this. So definitely, so definitely, the men in black are tied to the Mothman because they're. Oh yeah, they're, totally. They're, so they're the Mothman's PR. <laughs> yeah, basically. yeah, you could say that in a yeah. way. Yeah, I mean, it's that's what it sounds like. It, it sounds like this. So now, did they believe the Men in Black were tied to the Ing? Because as we're sitting here talking, I, I'm looking up the story of Ingrid Cole. It, it, in Der, uh, Derenberger, right? Is that his name? Mm-hmm. He was not. Yeah. The, he was not the only person to see Ingrid Cole, according to this. That the first yeah, sighting no, yeah, correct. was a couple of kids saw this character that they later fig- attributed to being an injured cold. So, man, that's kind of strange. So, and this is all the same time in the same area. This Ingrid Cold, the Men in Black, the Mothman's all happened at the same time. And the, and the UFOs, yeah, all going the, on at the same time. So... All right. Now, before I give my theory, because now my theory is becoming clear, mm. crystal clear on what's going on. Mm. Let's end it. Let's 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 tie this into the tragedy in Point Pleasant on this was the Silver Bridge. Yes. Yeah. OK, so tell our listeners, you know, what happened and and, and during mm-hmm. that event. So okay, so on I believe yeah, it was December fifteenth, nineteen sixty seven, um, the iconic Silver Bridge it it connected Point Pleasant, um, West Virginia to Gallopolis, Ohio. Um, it was in the evening time, full of holiday shoppers. Um, the, the bridge was actually almost in a traffic jam situation. It was full of cars. And one minute the bridge was there and the next minute it was gone and then it collapsed into the, you know, freezing Ohio river. And, you know, uh, it was interesting. There was, a, there was people who had saw this bridge their entire life, you know, and they're outside and they look over and they talk about, you know, the bridge wasn't there. And, um, 
in the end, 46 people were killed. And um, there was an extensive, you know, search for survivors. And, I mean, in a, in a town like Point Pleasant in the 1960s, everybody knew everybody. And there wasn't, there wasn't a single person who wasn't personally affected by this tragedy. You know, either their, you know, their husband or wife was on the bridge or, you know, um, one of their children was on the bridge or you know, niece or nephew or best friend. So, it would I mean, it really just tore the whole community apart. And it, it was at that point that the Mothman sightings at that point kind of ceased. And there are different theories about that. Some people say, you know, this, this some of my skeptics kind of would say that, you know, after this horrible tragedy, you know, we had time you know, to make up stories about the Mothman. But other people think, you know, that, that maybe this there was a reason why the Mothman sightings stopped with the Silver Ridge collapse. But, yeah, it was, it was, a, it was a really, really tragic event. So, so has the Mothman sightings in, in the Point Pleasant area totally stopped then to this day, or has there have there been some more recent sightings since the bridge collapse? Um, at, at that point, the Mothman sightings abruptly stopped, and there was I mean there there was there was really no more reports of the Mothman being seen at that time. Um, since, since then there have been kind of scattered reports of the Mothman. Um, I, um, you know, and, and, and still in the TNT area and the Point Pleasant outside of Point Pleasant. And I mean, I, I talked to a gentleman who, um, a couple years ago said that he encountered the Mothman in 2016. Um, but yeah, they're, they're really scattered and far and few between, but they, they do occur but there definitely seemed to have been a sudden start and a sudden stop with this period of sightings in the sixties. Now we, now we kind of touched on this, that because uh, at the time people thought, you know, he was kind of, the Mothman was kind of a warning about the bridge collapsing um, because he disappeared soon after it happened. Mm -hmm. Um, but that other yeah. places in history and in time since then, supposedly there have been humanoid sightings, uh, flying humanoid sightings, uh, most notably like at 9-11 when the, when the uh, one airliner hit one of the Twin Towers. There were reports of a Mothman-like creature in there. So, so in other words, it's become kind of a mythology that uh, this creature shows up as a is a warning of impending doom um is there any yeah, more the case is there any more cases uh, is there any more cases off the top of your head that you can think of a, uh, that maybe back that claim up um yeah there there are there are there are some reports the mothman was supposedly seen before the chernobyl disaster in 1986 um you mentioned september 11 2001 uh, there are reports of the Mothman um, before the Mexican swine flu of 2009, and I believe there are reports, yeah, there are reports um, of Mothman sightings prior to the Fukushima nuclear disaster of, I think it was 2011. So, yeah, the, there, there, are, there is a history of you know, sightings of this type of creature before kind of, you know, um, is there a, is there a truth? A truth to the rumor that there was a Mothman sighting before opening day uh, at Cleveland Brown Stadium every year for the last twenty four years. <laughs> oh, I don't know about boy. that one. <laughs> I mean, talk about impending disaster. Is the oh. But uh, <laughs> but uh, well, what I find interesting because okay, so and this is yeah, this might be kind of you know off the wall, but. You know, we're talking about there's an alien landed on 77. The men in black uh -huh. are, are coming around saying, um, you know, quit talking about this Mothman thing. You know, quit talking. And, yeah. and, and this thing is seen out there, you know, hiding around the TNT factory, chasing people off. Mm -hmm. and, and then as soon as the bridge collapses, he's gone. You know, you know what this sounds like to me? This sounds like these aliens landed. Okay, 
and the Mothman was their like their pet, okay, like their dog. And then <laughs> as soon as they landed and they land, the Mothman just takes off, okay. And you know how a dog when he's all cooped up after interstellar travel or whatever is just going to take off and and go running in the woods or whatever. And they're trying to track get him coax this thing back to the back to the spaceship so they can get out of there because. Here, here's the Mothman just out causing trouble, chasing everybody around, just wanting to have fun, jumping up on the cars, you know, stuff like that. These guys are like, hey, don't go out there. You know, quit talking about the Mothman. You're agitating. You're agitating our pet. Okay, we're just trying to get him back to the spaceship. Every time you guys go out there, you, you get him all riled up and he runs away again. And before they can get him back in the spaceship, he goes and screws up the bridge and collapses the bridge. And, and, and then they're like, crap, we got to go get the dog and get out of here. Because he just crapped all over somebody's, you know, brand new couch or something like that. I mean, that's totally what that feels to me like that they, they landed, the Mothman got loose from them. You know, and I'm just putting it in the picture of a family traveling with their dog. Okay. <laughs> and the dog. You know, so you can kind of have a frame of reference. And they can't get the dog back. The dog's just out there having fun, running around, chasing people. And and they're just like, hey, quit going out there and agitate. We're tr- we almost got him. And you keep telling a story and somebody goes out there and, and gets him all riled up. You know? Well, that, that, uh, Alyssa, Alyssa, what do you think about this scenario? <laughs> hey, hey, listen, we're going to embarrass Alyssa, Alyssa now. She dropped off the call an hour ago because she couldn't stay awake because she fell asleep. Yeah, she she <laughs> dropped off at about, yeah, it's been close to close to at least 30 minutes ago. <laughs> she t- and so, th- so we're pulling back the curtain on, on, on the podcasting world, and this is what happens. We, we, we told her somebody... that she's getting as bad as the judge. Yeah. Oh my God. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. She's like, oh, guys, I can't. She's texting me and Jason. And she's like, guys, I can't stay awake. I've been up. I, she was up like uh, however long and working and stuff. And yeah, like, she did oh, a boy. double yesterday. <laughs> she did. Oh, I feel bad. <laughs> <laughs> well, we you know, we don't want to <laughs> abuse your good graces either. I mean, I understand uh, you have an appointment that you have to attend to in the morning. So I know we gotta we gotta start wrapping things up, uh, Shane. We don't want to abuse our guests. Well, our oh, guests sometimes <laughs> sometimes sometimes our guests like being abused. What are you talking about? <laughs> <laughs> wow. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, so I mean, that's as soon as we were talking about and bringing all that stuff together. That's kind of what came to came to mind, like. I mean, I know that sounds off the wall, but doesn't that sort of have a, like a little, like a, a little, maybe a grain of truth maybe to it that that could, that could be what that whole uh, incident was, was like these aliens just lost control of something and were desperately trying to get him back before he, he did something. And well, he did something. I <laughs> well, I mean, I've heard I've heard a lot of wild theories about the Mothman, but that 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 might be up there as one of the craziest ones I've heard. I agree. <laughs> I agree with you, Cameron. That is uh, one benign theory that it would have never crossed my mind. <laughs> or is it, yeah, I never thought about that one. <laughs> or is it so crazy that it just may be the best theory you've ever heard? I don't know. Well, we, don't can't, know. we can't rule it out. It just seems highly unlikely. That's all. <laughs> yeah. I, I don't oh, know. No, yeah, I kind of agree. No, wait a second. How does this seem unlikely? Oh, man. Do I, do I have to write a paper on this to defend my theory? Is that how? Is that how? I can't believe. I think it makes total sense. But, uh, I mean, so so what do you think? What, what do you think, Cameron? You've done a lot of research. Mm-hmm. You're close to this subject. Um, you've, t- you know, you're the number two guy. You've talked to the number one guy extensively. What, like, what? What's the feeling that you guys have about this? Well, um, yeah, I, I can't speak for Jeff, but um, 
you know, my, myself, you know, I think one of the big questions that I that I ask and I think about and a lot of people think about is, you know, why why did Mothman come? You know, what was the reason behind these, you know, these these visits, these, these sightings? And you know, there there is this talk of, um, um, you know, is is Mothman, you know, uh, is he a harbinger of doom? You know, right. does Mothman come to warn of, you know, coming tragedy? And, you know, there's definitely possible. I've also personally, I've also wondered to myself, you know, maybe Mothman's presence, you know, if not to foretell or warn of a coming event or tragedy is simply to bear witness and that's uh, just something that, that I that I personally have, have thought about and, and and think that maybe, you know, maybe there's something to that. Wow. So yeah. have, have you, so you have spoken to some people who, who were eyewitnesses back then and now, correct? Yes. What, yeah. What do, what do they think? Like, what do, I mean, other than just telling you like about their experience, they had to. I mean, did you ask them what they thought thought it was that they were seeing, or um, how what they felt it might have been? Um, yeah, just um, there's. Um, speaking of Linda Scarberry, she's known as the original Mothman witness I mentioned earlier. Um, you know, she she always had this, you know, kind of. Oh, this horrible feeling about her encounter. And she was, like I said, she was always really haunted by it, you know, for the rest of her life. And she, she, she definitely thought that there was something kind of malevolent about the Mothman. And, you know, she, she definitely thought there was something, I mean, I would say evil there. And, you know, there are other witnesses I've talked to who, um, you know, had, had had experiences you know during the 60s who and there's a, there are some instances where they thought you know Mothman was this really angelic creature and you know there's some people I am uh Faye, Faye DeWitt who I mentioned earlier she she told me that she thinks that it was kind of like this weird escaped creature and she, she personally believes the government went in there found it and removed it and that, you know, she said, it's been gone. It's been gone since then. The government came in the TNT area and took it away, you know, to experiment on it. And that's basically what she told me. So, again, there's there's all kinds of different theories. At, you know, everybody seems to have their own kind of opinion on it. See, she just, she just bumped up against my escaped intergalactic pet theory. <laughs> and you yeah, kind of, yeah, in a way, maybe. Yeah. You know? And you glossed right over it. Oh my goodness! I can't believe it. Well, I, I certainly um, this is a fascinating subject. I mean, like you said, the books, a movie. Uh, you know, you guys are going out giving talks on this. There's a museum, um, the festival, which you know anybody that's ever. Uh, we've never made it down to it, and I think it's was can it's been canceled for this year. Yes. Yeah, I was real. I was I was so sad when when Ashley and Jeff announced that it is canceled this year. It will be it'll take place in, at the normal time in 2021. Okay, and everybody that I know that's been down there says that's just a fantastic uh, festival, a great time. Um, so, yeah, it's now so, the largest festival in West Virginia. Really? Okay. Yeah. Uh, but, uh, I mean, so there's something to this for this to have lasted this long, um, for the witnesses that went on the record, you know, there's something to this. And I, maybe we're never going to know until the next time Ingrid Cold and his 1965 interspace a uh, Cadillac strolls through the universe and has a flat tire and a Mothman <laughs> gets loose again. I don't know, but uh, I, I, it's fascinating. It really is. It's fascinating to, 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 to all the different uh, theories and, and stuff. And uh, I mean, Cameron, we certainly appreciate you coming on and, and telling these, telling us these stories and giving us your theories. And um, I mean, I'm sure a lot of people are going to be on Google 
tomorrow or after Friday after they hear this episode going, man, what's this? Who's this person? Where's this at? You know, checking this stuff out. And I think that's the best thing about this is passing on some information that people can go down another rabbit hole and, and yes, uh, check some stuff out. So Yeah, yeah, I, I think that's awesome. So, so Cameron, do you have, if somebody, um, some people, you know, here, after hearing this episode, um, is there any place they can find information about you giving talks, giving, you know, giving some speeches after all the uh, restrictions are lifted? Is there some place that they can go and find you and, uh, not necessarily that you want a bunch of people making contact with you. Okay. But yeah. Oh, but if, but if somebody asked me, I will give you Cameron's number. No, um, <laughs> if, but, but you know, so, so people can, uh, if they want to go see you, uh, give a lecture, give a talk once. Yeah. Yeah. I always, um, I, I usually, I definitely always post about my events on my social media and, uh, you can find me on Facebook uh, Cameron Jones. Um, I'm also really active on Twitter and, uh, I definitely post about all my upcoming events on my Facebook and you can find me on Twitter at para P A R A underscore mystery. So it's para mystery mm-hmm. and you can find me there. And I always, um, yeah, I always give the dates and times and locations of my upcoming talks. And I've already, re- I've already gotten a few of them rescheduled and I might even be doing some later this fall, so I'm, I'm hoping that, that that works out and definitely doing a bunch next year. Well, make sure um, make sure you let us know so we can put them up on our After the Shadows page uh, so that everybody that follows us on that can can keep track of you, uh, too. You know, make sure. Oh, you, I would love that. Yeah, that would be make, awesome. Make sure you send us that information. And we are definitely going to make a date because I we, we want to have you back and talk some UFO and some Bigfoot and other cryptid stuff that you're into. Uh, that would be sweet, yeah. Yes, we do. We'll definitely uh, we'll definitely uh, make sure we have a round two of this discussion. And after you have some time to think about it, I think maybe you might concede that my theory, maybe top three. Maybe tough. I I, I think I will stay up. I'll stay up for hours thinking about ah. it. <laughs> oh, going! I can't believe this ridiculousness that I just heard. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you very much, Cameron. I'm glad we uh, glad we got to do this. And you know what? I don't feel bad for Alyssa or the judge. They just don't know what they're missing. They missed out Alyssa, tonight. Yeah. That was for yeah, sure. They missed out. Yeah, they missed out. <laughs> and I know Alyssa didn't mean to. But I'm still going to make fun of her. I mean, oh, yeah, we uh, have to. We have to. <laughs> <laughs> so, well, hey, thanks for uh, thanks for joining us tonight. We hope uh, all of our uh, listeners enjoyed it, too. And make sure you uh, check Cameron out and go see him when he when he starts going back out and, and do, give him some talks. Because I have a feeling that uh, it's going to be a fun time. So, so Cameron, we'll, uh, we'll catch you later. We can't wait to have uh, the second part of this uh, interview, so to speak. And uh, thanks for joining us tonight. Thank, yeah, thank you, guys. I appreciate it. Yeah, thank you. Yep. You have a good yep. night. Yep, we'll catch you. Yep. Yeah. Mike. Ladies and gentlemen, a final word. Please visit us on our Facebook page, which is facebook.com forward slash from the shadows podcast. And on our Instagram page at Instagram.com forward slash from the shadows podcast. You can visit our web page at from the shadows podcast dot go daddy sites dot com. Or contribute to our Facebook discussion page called after the shadows. And tweet us on our Twitter feed at twitter.com forward slash podcast underscore from. Thank you for joining us, and we look forward to hearing from you all. Until next time, never shy away from the darkness or what may be lurking in the shadows.
We are out. Ha 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 ha.